Um, Rakai Health Access Program uh, is currently one of the largest and oldest uh, organizations focusing on uh, HIV AIDS, uh, associated, in associated infections, reproductive health in Africa. Uh, it's community based. Uh, and uh, currently, we are conducting HIV prevention studies uh, doing uh, clinic, clinical and laboratory investigations and uh, operations research to evaluate uh, strategies that can improve service delivery in the south, southern Uganda. Uh, as you can see, the infrastructure there. Uh, it's fascinating that we have that uh, down in Rakai, uh, but it's partly uh, part of the effort by the NIH uh, in, in the lab. Most of the infrastructure is uh, supported by the NIH. Uh, the Rakai region comprises uh, agrarian trading and fishing communities. Um, the agrarian is basically the agriculture, and then the trading is along the main uh, uh, the main roads. Uh, those of you who have been to Rakai, uh, we are along the Mutukula uh, Road, uh, Kaliso. Uh, why do we call ourselves the Rakai Health Sciences Program? Uh, where does this Rakai thing come from? Uh, Rakai is uh, basically where uh, the first HIV AIDS case was uh, published about uh, in Uganda. That was in, uh, the, in, in the last set by Professor Sewadam. That was in 1985. Uh, this morning uh, we had that uh, first session and I was disappointed when uh, somebody was talking of uh, uh, Rutaya's uh, case as uh, as if it was the first case, but uh, already we had information uh, from Sewata and Tim uh, uh, about the same disease in 1982. Um, Rakai Health Sciences Program runs a community cohort uh, study that is in the 40 communities of Rakai. Uh, this was established in 1994, and uh, basically we uh, carry out census activities, which is uh, a numeration of uh, members in the communities, just counting uh, household members, and uh, also capture information about uh, uh, their residence status. We want to know whether they are permanent, whether they are visitors, um, uh, and then get to know the new uh, paths in the community and uh, deaths and also family relationships. We want to know who is uh, the household head, who is the, who is the son to, to, to the head, who is the, um, who is the sister, who is the sibling. Who, uh, and then we also want to capture information on household assets. This is important in constructing the social economy status uh, in this. We also capture information on geospatial data. Um, uh, then uh, we capture information on key structures in the communities. We want to know the schools, bars, hotels. Uh, this information is important as you uh, try to explain HIV AIDS. Uh, you want to see how uh, it impacts on HIV incidence, uh, HIV prevalence. We also carry out uh, surveys uh, targeting uh, the 15 to 49 uh, age group. And there we capture information on the demographics, uh, social networks, and behaviors. Uh, the healthcare utilization. And in the survey, we capture biological uh, specimens, uh, that is serum, plasma, uh, for HIV and other infections. Uh, we uh, also collect swabs, we collect uh, uh, now with the circumcision, we also collect uh, foreskins. Uh, we also uh, uh, collect buffy cord specimens for human genetic testing. Uh, the community cohort study supports observational research, uh, where we do quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, we, we 
it supports the randomized trials, uh, basic research, implementation science, molecular IP, clinical research, clinical care, and also has a training component for students, especially who come around during the summer. They can be able to do their pra uh, practicums and. Uh, uh, we have uh, students from the U.S. there, and uh, also international universities. RHSP is a global collaboration that starts with the Uganda Virus Research Institute under the Ministry of Health, uh, then Magere University, uh, Columbia University, Hawkins University, the uh, uh, CDC, Karolinska Institute, uh, the NERD, uh, uh, and uh, other research collaborators, as you can see, the University of Washington and Pittsburgh, and the School of Hygiene and Medicine, Illinois, Chicago, and Walter Reed. And here we can see our the, the founders actually are listed on here uh, Professor Sewada, uh, David Sewada, Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell, Professor Ron Gray, and Maria Weber. Uh, those uh, two, uh, Ron Gray and Maria Weber, uh, uh, based at Hopkins University. Uh, the cohort has uh, so far uh, run into the 19th round. Uh, a round is actually uh, the, the, the survey and the census activities organized uh, according to the 12 to 18 month. Uh, uh, activities uh, each round uh, goes for about that that time and in each round uh, we are able to enroll new participants uh, and also follow up old participants so by in the 18th round uh, in the 18th round alone we, we enrolled 22,000 participants all together we had uh, the 80,000 participants also, the, uh, the biological samples collected over time. Uh, we have now over 500,000 uh, biological samples archived. And historically, uh, this data has been stored uh, by rounds uh, in Fox Pro databases. And uh, each round has on average uh, 15 tables. Uh, so by the 14th round, we had about 200 tables. So for a data manager, um, if you got a data request uh, to look at uh, uh, data from maybe different dimensions, a data request either comes in the form of a research question. Somebody uh, wants to know how to answer a research question based on the data Raka already has. And this goes back in time. Sometimes it's uh, right from when we started in 1994. Uh, some requests can be as simple as cross-sectional, other requests can be longitudinal. Uh, let's see what we have uh, for, for such data requests. And uh, uh, the different uh, uh, dimensions of the data in there, it can be from sensors, it can be from survey, it can be from the clinic, it can be from the laboratory. Depending on the, the data request, it can really be overwhelming where you have a data request cutting across uh, all these multiple dimensions and even the depth, as I said, depending on the statistical method that will be used. If it's going to be longitudinal, then a longitudinal data set will be very challenging to put together, thinking about all the hundred of tables. And that can be very frustrating for investigators who are asking these questions that a data manager needs to turn up a, a, data, a data set in a record time. So, to go around that, uh, with the support from the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and uh, Computational Biology, we have act on developing a data warehouse to consolidate that data into a single repository. Uh, we are specifically wanted to enable researchers to correlate that data and analyze it from a single uh, database. That way we will be able to achieve uh, a, 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 you know, an analyzable data set in the record time and also be able to have uh, a framework where we could easily repeat such tasks for putting together the data set uh, as we integrate in your data. And uh, 
to have that data in a single repository, you are able to have reproduced separate reports, which we will not do before the data warehouse. And then the data fidelity over time, when you have uh, controlled access to the data, you are sure it's accurate, and then uh, you have propagated documentation. Uh, it's very challenging looking for uh, variables to answer a specific question in uh, the documents, the questionnaires that we use as uh, data dictionaries. Uh, but with a data warehouse, where I'll show you that we now have a filter for data dictionary, it's you know, very fast, and then also being able to audit uh, um, the actions in the data warehouse. Uh, uh, conceptually, uh, we thought of organizing these Fox Pro tables in two around specific uh, databases and be able to look at the unique dimensions of the data uh, to formulate a data model that would then uh, yield to uh, normalized tables that would be used in constructing a data warehouse. And uh, the implementation here. Uh, looks at um, uh, the source uh, where we have the Fox Pro tables, the multiple Fox Pro tables. But before the Fox Pro tables, there are other disparate sources of data we don't show here. That uh, when you go to the lab, for example, you find uh, uh, the machines like uh, the ELISA machines giving you text files, uh, and then you go to the CD4 machines giving you uh, Excel files, so the viral load machines. Just here are machines giving the Excel files. So behind uh, the Fox Pro tables, again, we had uh, uh, programming uh, written to transform those text files into uh, the tables, which would be uh, upsized using the uh, setting upsizing wizard um, to SQL uh, staging tables around specific, in, in, in round specific databases. And then uh, at that point, we had to freeze the Fox Pro uh, tables to make sure there are no more edits on the host pro tables, but only in the SQL server environment where we'll be able to, uh, to you know, control access and document any updates. And then at staging level, uh, we'll be able to identify uh, the, the unique domains, uh, family member mobility that comes from the census, uh, baseline follow ups, partner that comes from the survey. And then from the lab, we have the HIV results, bioload, uh, CD for CPs, and several others. And then also be able to identify the personal identifiable uh, columns for exclusion, uh, because this is highly sensitive data if you want to ensure confidentiality. Then create a data model uh, for the target tables. Uh, to get tables and then at the data mat level you have those normalized tables created excluding the PII and the also creation of SQL server integration services packages to load the data from staging tables to the data mat tables and also have views created to support uh, queries and data visualization. At the staging uh, level, as you can see, we have uh, we have uh, around the specific databases here. Uh, each database containing uh, about 15 tables in there. So, if you are to look across all these uh, databases, it's about uh, 300 tables, at, uh, and then uh, we had we had to develop um, the packages. Uh, to transfer data from the uh, from the staging uh, around specific databases to the data map, and this is what you have here. Each each of these packages looks just the same, uh, but pulling data uh, for the same tables. And then uh, at the, the data map level, uh, we now have those hundreds of tables collapsed in two fewer tables, that you can see. But the interesting thing here is the log table. For each table, um, we had to develop a log table. And this is for uh, keeping track of uh, updates, deletions, insertions, uh, and a trail kind of implementation. Meaning that we have uh, triggers uh, to look out for those kind of actions. And then also we have the views, and these views 
uh, can support the visualization. On top of this, you can have uh, uh, Tableau. You can also have uh, for statisticians who are not uh, uh, comfortable with the SQL Server. You can connect to these views via Starter, via Ara, and be able to do interesting things with your models uh, without bothering to get into the SQL Server environment. Uh, and then the views are not uh, just plain. Behind the views, you have the uh, some uh, business rules, the implementation of the business rules. For example, this view here is for HIV prevalence, but you can see that HIV prevalence is not just the HIV. If you wanted to look at a model for HIV prevalence, you want to think about other variables that are associated with HIV prevalence. So in your business rules, you want to pull data on age, marital status, gender, and all those other interesting things. But the important here, you are standardizing the construction of that data set that you will use uh, for modeling the HIV prevalence so that you don't have, again, different things happening with the different statisticians. So at the end of the day, we are able to provide uh, summarization and visualization of large uh, uh, amounts of data. Uh, where we are able to only reveal aggregated data. You don't get to see the individual level data. Uh, we don't want to have people looking at that and misusing it. And then we allow uh, users to interact with that data. Uh, using Tableau, we, uh, uh, we are able to uh, enable access to a broader research community. So far, access is allowed to the RHSP community. Uh, GHU and NIAT. Um, so currently, we have a dashboard uh, that uh, displays prevalence trends. Uh, you can uh, be able to uh, play with this dashboard. As you can see, these widgets here, you can be able to filter the data, look at uh, different things by agrarian, trading communities, and be able to stratify by different things. We are planning to, for instance, add coverage all that. Uh, so we are also able to publish now all this data um, quickly. We, we have some publications already coming out as you can see HIV prevention efforts and HIV incidents. This data is coming from the data mart. And uh, that uh, solution now is uh, affording us uh, the accurate data in real time. Uh, we are able to correlate this data from a single repository quickly and the standardized integration of new data. This solution came with a data dictionary. We have sample queries, we have a, a data model, and training materials. So now we are able to turn around the data set in just hours compared to the weeks and days we used to do that. The uh, results are now reproducible, and we now have a filterable data dictionary. So now we are moving towards really an open uh, information sharing platform where we can have RHSP discovered through analytics. And also this platform will enable us to implement interesting predictive models where you can even integrate artificial intelligence to do in, uh, to support decision making. So but at the end of it all we have noticed that uh, this is a very expensive venture that was not just about the infrastructure and the <coughs> systems. But now they actually contracted full-time experts to construct the system to get rid of the legal systems. So I want to acknowledge uh, our funders and I want to thank you all for your attention. This program, the TV Portals program, it's kind of difficult to see on the screen there, but uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the website, which is here, TV Portals with an S. Dot NIAID dot NIH dot GOV. This is a, a resource for tuberculosis research. And what's interesting about this particular uh, resource is that it combines data from lots of different resource, lots of different domains in a way that really hasn't been done before. So I thought uh, that, that might be helpful to, to see. So obviously tuberculosis, there are lots of factors that go into whether or not you get sick and how sick you get, uh, depending on, on all these various things, including things like um, 
you know, any comorbidities that may exist there, HIV, diabetes, uh, even things like your microbiome, which we heard a little, a little bit about yesterday. Uh, also, certain uh, demographic uh, considerations, certain lifestyle considerations, the genetics of the bacteria itself, and of course your own genetics. These are all different components that play a part in uh, how affected you are by uh, tuberculosis infection. And trying to understand the interplay of all of these various components can be difficult. Uh, and there's not a lot of transparency there. So what we've done is try to combine all that information together in a way that you can query all of it at the same time. So let me explain very quickly how we do that. Uh, obviously, tuberculosis is a global problem. Uh, even fair Uganda is affected, and in fact, these are one of the 30 high burden tuberculosis countries. Uganda is certainly affected, and not only affected by tuberculosis, but also by drug-resistant tuberculosis. So you can see that, again, Uganda does have some multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis, and of course this is a, a growing problem worldwide. Some countries are more affected than others, um, but obviously this is something that we are all concerned about given that we are only a plane ride away from each other. Uh, so the mission of the, of the TB Portals program is to share all of this data, and we do this by um, making data available, by bringing the, the data together and applying new tools and fostering this international network uh, of, of, provide, of data providers and physicians and other people who are going to be using this kind of information. Uh, we do this through certain different areas, such as the, the data itself, uh, handling the data, building software around the data, doing research on the data, and then transmitting the knowledge that is learned from this data out through publications, manuscripts, and other, other means. The program exists on many different uh, countries, so you can see in blue, these are partner countries. In other words, these are places where uh, we have uh, agreements in place with hospitals and governments to uh, collect in a, in a way that works for that country the various uh, kinds of data we're looking at, clinical data, demographic data, uh, uh, x-ray and uh, CT, so radiological data, as well as samples of the bacterial genomic material which we then sequence and provide the sequence data for. There are also other collaborators shown here in red and even some other places which are giving us feeds of their data but are not uh, partners per se. So you can see it's widespread and uh, growing, just like tuberculosis. Uh, in fact, uh, last year, here we are all gathered together in uh, the country of Romania, which is one of the partner countries. And the people who are involved here are from all the various different uh, partner countries, which you saw here in blue, uh, mostly focused in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, where there's very high prevalence uh, of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, which is the focus for us. But as we've started to expand more recently in Congo, South Africa, India, China, we expect to see uh, many more people in our steering committee. Okay, just very quickly, I'd like to talk about the data itself. There are 1,400 published cases. There are more cases in the database, but they're not published yet. That's because the countries themselves determine when uh, the data becomes public. They are subject to their own IRBs. They make their own decisions. The data are collected not as part of a clinical trial, but rather this is a natural history study. In other words, the people uh, on the ground determine based on their own selection criteria what data to share with us. We try to give guidance, things like we want uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis cases, we want cases that were difficult, uh, because the idea is to share these in kind of a, a case study, uh, if you like, rather than a, a formally organized clinical trial with controls and so forth. It's, it's more of almost, if you like, uh, a museum of, of uh, 
cases of tuberculosis. Uh, of, of those 1,400 published cases, about 75% have some drug resistance, in some cases extreme drug resistance. They represent 10 different countries, and most importantly, the descriptors here of the data, the, the genomic data, the radiological data, are all, it's not just that you see a picture of the x-ray, but rather the x-ray is itself annotated by radiological experts, radiologists and others, who understand these data and are and know this is a cavity, this is a nodule, and they locate them and annotate the images in a way that is, that makes them amenable to things like artificial intelligence. Right, Rose? <laughs> and Agnes, I don't know if she's here or, uh, or uh, anyway. Uh, so again, yeah, here's the here's the imaging data. There's a lot there, and especially uh, we're especially proud of this. Uh, genomic sequencing of these cases. And so in this way we have, for an individual patient, an individual patient case, we have everything that, uh, that's relevant to the treatment of that particular case, including uh, which uh, drugs they were given, which ones were effective, uh, what their multi-drug resistant uh, profile looked like, which drugs they were resistant to, uh, treatment schedule, as well as x-rays and CTs that were taken along the way, and, uh, and of course, the genomic sequencing of a sputum sample that they provided. And, and there is even more data than this. Uh, so here's kind of a, a, a view. Remember that there's 1,400 that are public. Another 1,000 are still private pending publication. So it's coming. And then this is the full data set versus the pr public uh, data set, which you saw before. We get a feeling for the uh, outcomes. We track outcomes, things like, and these are these are uh, WHO uh, outcomes, standard outcomes. So they're not just made up. Um, the treatment was a failure. The treatment was cured. The patient died. Uh, various different outcomes, and then again resistance. In addition to the data itself, we've provided ways to interact with and understand the data. Uh, and they are uh, our data browser, also what we call our data exploration portal, or depot, the genomics analysis portal, and soon to launch the radiology or radiometric analysis portal. All of these are accessed through the, the main URL here. I'm going to go through and describe these very quickly and uh, flash through them so you can get a feel for what's there, but I encourage you to come and visit. There's resources completely free and, and open for your use. Uh, this is the data browser, right? Here we can see an individual case. Here are the total number of public cases. And of course, the partners who are contributing their data, they can see their private data as well. But this is only the public view. And the public view, again, you can see those charts we just looked at, the number of cases. And here's what the data actually looks like. I know this is really too small to see. But you can see patient information, of course, everything is anonymized, of course. Um, uh, some of the definitions, such as here's the uh, ICD-10 diagnosis code, age, um, uh, where it's localized, uh, things like uh, uh, BMI and other information about the patient. The data is more or less complete. We're aiming to get it more complete, but it is what it is. It's what we're given. Down here, in particular, here's the lab results, the negative, negative, positive, drug susceptibility is resistant to all these different drugs, and everything is following, again, WHO standards. The treatment history, the outcome, this particular patient was cured. Uh, we also hear some of the radiological data. You can see both CT and X-ray, and its localization within the lungs. Genomic information, here's the sequencing data, and we link back out to the NIH NCBI resources. All the genomic data is also public and can be accessed through the NCBI, and we create links back to them. Also, we, from the genomic information, we also do a spoligotyping and lineage uh, analysis based on uh, the sequence itself. Uh, this is, so that's the case data, that's the data browser. Then the depot, the data exploration portal, this is where we spent a lot of effort and the idea here is that we, this is a tool to do statistical analysis between two what we call 
virtual cohorts. Remember, this is a natural history study. We don't have cohorts in the sense of clinical trials. But what this allows us to do is make, yes, three minutes, selections of the various uh, characteristics of people. So let's say we want uh, women older than 30 who have multi-drug resistant, and we want to compare those against uh, women younger than 30 who have multi-drug resistant and see if there's some kind of factor that may distinguish these women other than, of course, their age. So what we can do is we can go in and define the cohort by choosing all the various uh, factors. And we see how the cohort is then rep is represented of the 1,200 or so cases at the time that this query was made, about 600 match these criteria. We make one cohort, we make another cohort, and then what we, are, we, what we can do is start to look at the statistical comparison between them. And we can see here for this particular one, obviously age of onset was the, diff, the distinguishing, the top distinguishing factor for the clinical data. But of course there are many others, and you can see the p-values here. So, uh, and by, you can see that there's a, um, uh, you can scroll down, and as you go through, you, they become less and less significant. And in this way, you can start to begin to make hypotheses about, oh, that's interesting. I never would have thought that this factor influenced the, dis the distinguish, it was a distinguishing factor between these two cohorts. There are other kinds of analysis that are available, such as uh, you know, more detailed information. Here we can start to see lower p-values. This is for GWAS. This is for other kinds of genomic uh, metrics. Uh, full genomic uh, 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 analysis, uh, so-called Manhattan plot. Uh, again, I'm just trying to race through this very quickly. Individual mutations, because we have the genomic data, it's all here. What this means, we actually talked to somebody who said, if we, the data that's in here, you run a couple of queries, that's a poster right there. So within about 10, 15 minutes, you can create scientific posters and perhaps even pub publications out of the data that's here by using what you know about tuberculosis and querying it against the data using the tools that are here. Sometimes people want to just download all the data, but the tools are here that allow you to work through the data much faster than you would be otherwise. So we encourage you to use the tools that are here. Just to conclude, here's this genomics analysis portal. It's a more in-depth analysis of the genome. In fact, we even have, I like this particular one, a resistance prediction. We have three different algorithms that you can choose from or even combine to take the genomic uh, sequence and determine its uh, uh, resistance profile. Uh, more things about the genomics here. Again, I'm just going very fast. The radiology is coming. It'll allow us to compare the images in a more deep way. We're doing research with the various countries, including uh, these, all these various projects that in, our, in, our, in addition to the data collection. Uh, we're publishing papers, we're doing artificial intelligence. This is kind of interesting. We're mapping AI le uh, detected lesions between CTs and x-rays. And we're publishing. Uh, these are partners who are starting to use our data and we welcome other partners. Uh, it's mentioned in the NIH Strategic Plan for Data Science, the TV portals. And uh, we invite you to partner with us and engage in using the TV portals. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, the topic um, that we're thinking about um, within the academy with um, our colleagues is seeing if we can um, uh, refine differentiated care for people living with HIV. And I'll just give a bit of an overview about differentiated care. So I'm sure everybody knows this data, but we still have a, a treatment gap of getting people on antiretroviral um, treatment. I think our people living with HIV not on ART is probably more like about 200,000 than 300,000 um, now, but um, this is an ongoing challenge, and it's an ongoing challenge because we still have people getting HIV, so we still have more and more people that need um, to get on treatment. Um, this is the most recent data that we can find on our gap, um, which is from 2017, which um, suggests that we are still not hitting our 90-90-90 targets 
of getting 90% um, of people aware of their status, 90% of those on treatment, and 90% virologically suppressed. So we still have some way to go. Uh, so the whole concept of differentiated care that the WHO are promoting around um, HIV treatment is that some patients will need more intensive support for their HIV care. So people who are struggling to take their tablets, who are um, have a detectable viral load, who are not doing very well, may need more intensive support. And there's some of our patients who need less intensive support. So I do a clinic in the UK as well as here, and my UK patients, I'm able to do a clinic in the UK every six months because my patients don't need to see me, um, um, you know, um, between the six month appointments that we have. Because of low drug stocks here, we tend to see our patients every month, if not every two months. Sometimes when stocks are very low, we have to see our patients every two weeks. This is putting a massive burden on our health system um, and if there is a way of differentiating this and saving costs, then it will reduce our burden. So this is a graph that we've come up with about thinking about targets for differentiated um, care. And um, the, the center of the target in green is those people who have an undetectable viral load are stable on their treatment and doing well. We've got the yellow group, who is, they have an undetectable viral load, and the word undetectable is not showing up, sorry about that, but this is an undetectable load group. But from our traditional assessments, and this is the, the crux of the, the work, our traditional assessments saying that they're adolescents or they're in discordant couples or pregnant, they're at slightly higher risk of, of becoming detectable. We then have those in the orange who are starting to get really worrying. They're in care, but have a detectable viral load. So we, they're a captive audience, they're engaged with us, which is great, but they either have just started treatment or they're recently failing and we've got to do something urgently to get their viral load under control. And then we've got this really worrying group, which is our most difficult group, and this is the group driving the epidemic and driving the, the um, new infections which is those who have a detectable viral load and are not in care and, um, and are not tested or they're already lost to follow up. So what we really want to look at is, okay, we've got our green group. Can we reduce the amount of interaction we're having with the green group? And can we increase the interaction that we're having with the reds, if we can find them, but also the oranges and the yellows? What can we do with those patients to keep them in care and try and get them um, to either stay undetectable or get undetectable, um, increase resources at those and reduce resources on the green group whilst keeping the greens green? And then we have this added problem, which is the problem coming up in the future, which is the comorbidities. So an increasing burden of non-communicable disease, mental health and hepatitis of people that really are not going to be high risk because of their HIV necessarily, but they're going to be a high risk of mortality and morbidity because they have these other comorbid conditions. And what resources do we need to spend and what in, uh, input do we need to put on those people? Now, this is a very traditional way of thinking of things, and this is how we have been thinking of these. And the way that we look at this is looking at our general statistical analysis. So our long-term cohorts of people on treatment, um, things like the IDEA cohort, other cohorts that we've looked at, including the ones at IDI, where we know that you know somebody's got a detectable viral load, or they've missed appointments, or they're not engaged in care, they're more likely to die. And that's using normal statistical methods. And then we've got healthcare worker experience and general person experience. So adolescents are a difficult group, therefore they must need increased care. Sex workers have got a risk of transmission, therefore we must put more attention or effort on them. But that's lumping people in groups. That's not really looking at people individually, it's looking at the entire group. So our question is, can we use new techniques, the sort of stuff that you guys are really good at, can we use new techniques to really come up with different um, different groups. Are these the right groups? Is this accurate? Are these the ones that we should be looking at? Are these the ones we should be uh, not looking at? Or are there subdivisions in these? Are there other factors which make somebody a high risk patient that is not our traditional way of thinking about things? And that's the, 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 the idea behind um, our, our possible new collaboration. 
So we met, we, we, we spoke to Dowdy, we spoke to Daniel, who I don't see, um, Eugene came, a whole group of people came, and we sat in our boardroom and we said, okay, we need to do this project on differentiated care. And um, there's a grant coming up, there's some welcome trust money, we need to apply for it. We got very excited and we sat in the room and we really didn't understand each other. Um, we had a lovely meeting and we thought we were ready to go with the project and we realized there was a lot more work to do. We weren't even speaking the same language and we needed to understand um, what each other were, what, what were talking about. Um, we needed to understand each other's data a bit more and we needed to understand each other's methodologies a bit more and what we've used in the past. So we then, rang up Welcome and said, okay, can we apply for kind of a development grant? Um, but to do that, we, um, they, and, they, and they said, yeah, you can apply for a development grant, um, but just send us a one page brief on what you want to do. In the meantime, we were approached by the um, a group from University of Cambridge, which is where I have my other appointment, who had done some of this work before in ICU. So it was an intensive care doctor and um, a computer scientist there who'd looked at um, poor outcomes or outcome measures using intensive care records. So in the UK, um, there is not much use of electronic medical records within the national health system. But intensive care units seem to be one of the places where a lot of data is collected electronically, much more than the rest of the health system. The rest of the health system is catching up a bit, but, but, it, but it's patchy and challenging. So these guys have done some work on trying to see which groups in ICU were at risk of worse outcomes. And so when we spoke to them, we thought, well, maybe we can use some of what 